After one year in the early access program on Steam, Dismantle finally inches towards 1.0 and this review is for anyone who's been waiting on that release, as early access games can be hit or miss. Or maybe, like me, you got it on launch and have been waiting for the actual final release to see how things turned out. Or maybe, just maybe, this is your first time hearing about Dismantle. Either way, let's break it down. As always, full disclosure, they sent me a copy. So who would like this game? If you are a fan of action RPG grinding, a constant treadmill of upgrades, plenty of meters and bars to fill, collecting, exploring, and of course, destruction, then this might be the game for you. The basic story goes like this. It was the end of the world, but you were actually prepared. Except for the fact that a couple years later, you're all out of food. Which means you'll have to leave your safe and cozy shelter and head out into the wasteland with nothing but a crowbar and a dream. Dismantle is a dual joystick melee game from 10 tons. That's right, a 10 tons game with no guns? But once you've left the confines of that shelter, oh boy, let the hacking and slashing begin. The big hook in this game is how everything can be destroyed. With the right tools and the appropriate power level, you can flatten everything into bits. You'll go from smashing mailboxes, to using a sledgehammer to destroy a car, to eventually demolishing entire houses to the very foundation. Those walls in the way might be annoying at hour 2, but by hour 10 or 15, they will kneel before your power. And all this wanton destruction gives you a bunch of materials, and it all follows a reasonable logic. Boxes give you wood, tires give you rubber, coffee mugs give you ceramic, and so on. It's not one-to-one, -one, but it is a lot more extensive than I had expected. Of course, you aren't alone in this world, as the remains of society have zombified in a variety of ways, and they are dead set on your demise. Combat is pretty basic here. It's dual joystick melee controls, a dodge roll, and a handful of things that you can throw. Knives, grenades, etc. This does change up a little bit in the late game, but the same basic premise applies. At the start, you are tasked with one main quest escape the island, but along the way, you pick up a whole heaping amount of side quests. Although calling them side quests can seem a bit misleading because there was some real important stuff contained within, and you're not going to want to skip those. Completing these quests gives you experience, but I should mention that just about everything you do in this game gives you experience. So even if you feel a bit stuck from dying over and over and over, which you will, you are still making progress bit by bit. And in doing so, the gameplay loop becomes this constant drip feed of, hey, you did a thing, keep doing more stuff, that feeds into itself in a really satisfying way. The grind is real, but it's also rewarding. But when you do gain a level, two things happen. Number one, the next time you rest at a campfire, you'll choose between three perks. Anyone who's played games from 10 tons knows they love those perk systems. And number two, as you gain levels, your character gets ideas for inventions. And that is how they gate your progress in the game, as certain items are required to visit certain areas. Though it did leave me wondering, all these amazing items you invent, but my dude can't think to craft a ladder? This is kind of a survival game, but only for the heat and the cold. Don't worry, there are no hunger or thirst meters here. But you will find a bunch of recipes to cook that give you permanent stat boosts. You can even use the farms you find to grow more crops if you want. And yes, there is fishing. Just because the world has ended does not mean you can't kick back for a bit, right? The island itself is quite substantial, especially considering that you're walking everywhere because, you know, apocalypse. There is indeed a fast travel system, but it has to be unlocked manually area by area. But speaking of the map, the actual map screen is super useful and there is very little guesswork once you understand what's important and what to look out for. Like any good open world game, there are plenty of hidden secrets to find, which makes the map worth exploring. Maybe you'll find a new recipe, or maybe someone buried a bunch of tires for whatever weird reason. Look, I'm not here to judge. Now, I did get stuck a few times, but I missed one specific bridge I needed to cross to hit the next main area. But overall, I was able to navigate pretty easily. Of course, since the map is also full of murderous creatures with ill intent, sooner or later, you're gonna die. Dying respawns you back at the last campfire you rested at. All the loot you had gets dropped except for your mana, and your corpse is marked on the map. All of the fleshy creatures respawn, so yeah, it's doing the Dark Souls thing. But more on that later. Considering how much crafting and upgrades you'll be doing, the UI lets you track just about anything. Which means you can easily make things look like an MMO exploded on your monitor, or you can focus on one upgrade at a time. 
Now on the downside, you only get one manual map marker, and I was kind of hoping for more, like Breath of the Wild. Sometimes I'd forget which bridge I had to go fix because I didn't bring enough materials for the portable lumberyard. Of course, what is a game like this without the enemies that will constantly try to murder you? And they have done a nice job here with both the enemy variety and keeping a consistent difficulty as your character gets more and more powerful. Just when you're finally one-shotting the standard zombie type, they're going to introduce faster, stronger, higher numbers, and most annoyingly, these bomb-throwing monstrosities that keep exploding my face off. I hate those guys. But to counteract that, you have options. Instead of taking this challenge head-on, there is a bit of a stealth system at play. Both with visual sight lines and more importantly, audio. You're breaking stuff, they're gonna hear you break stuff. You can invent and equip better gear to sneak better, and more importantly, backstabs do more damage. When you hit that late game, the power hit backstab is crucial. But sometimes you'll just want to run, and thankfully that is a valid strategy in most situations. Also doors. These aren't raptors, they have not learned to open doors yet, but god help us if they do. The boss fights can be a mixed affair. I did enjoy the mini bosses that you just kind of stumble across in the world, because it really increased the feeling of danger around every corner. But the main four bosses you'll face are nearly identical with a few added attacks each time. And that makes sense for the lore, but from the gameplay perspective, it felt a little bit flat, but it wasn't all that much fun the first time around. But back to the enemy respawning concerns. Deadly transmission is the answer you seek, as you can use those fast travel towers to make sure creatures you kill can no longer respawn in that given area, while also dropping a very useful crafting material. These towers will also tell you how many enemies still exist in that region. But maybe you want more challenge. Well, you're also covered here too. Ascension brings back the enemies you've killed and makes them stronger and drop better loot. The story here is told through audio logs, the environment, various collectibles, and your main character talking to himself with emoji. And yes, that can be turned off. It's not spectacular, but it gets the job done. The audio work here goes a long way to increasing the feeling of isolation and desolation, and that sound effect that plays when you enter a new named area is very satisfying. Now as someone who played this game in about three days, my first suggestion is space your playtime out. While there is a lot of content to explore here, trying to marathon dismantle might burn you out. And in particular, there were a couple times I thought the main quest was finally over, and then something else happens and a whole new area opens up. And I feel like that was a byproduct of being in early access and wanting to include some nice meaty updates. I get that. It's not a bad thing unless you're grinding through it trying to write a review before a deadline. Also of note, I felt the late game combat can feel a little cheap given your limited combat options and the sheer volume of enemies they give you to deal with at one time. And that was the only time I saw any issues in performance as one too many explosions does bog down the game engine. But there is just an insane amount of stuff to do here. I reached the end of the main quest at about 20 hours. Although, technically, I'm only 93% done because the final encounter looks like this. And I don't have the time to grind who knows how many more hours to gear up for that bit of insanity. My map at the end looked like this. So you can see, it'd be easy to clock 60 plus hours if you wanted to see everything of the launch day content. Perhaps more, I don't know. Overall, I enjoyed exploring the wasteland in Dismantle. It's one of the most ambitious games from 10 tons in quite some time, and I think they knocked it out of the park. If you like action RPGs and crafting, a mysterious island to explore, and the ability to destroy anything and everything, this game might just be the apocalypse you're looking for. Dismantle is leaving early access for full release on November 16th, and Attack Slug gives it an 8 out of 10. With great thunder, it hit Mother Earth and ripped her open. This is how manna came to us. The bittersweet gift from the sky.